Hi, it's Deborah Danielson. Welcome to the Rebel Podcast. This week, I'm really excited. This is part two of a little series that we're doing about teen mom, 16 and pregnant, and the whole franchise and how I got launched and our story. But just to bring you up to speed, last time we talked about the very first show that kicked off the Teen Mom franchise, and that was 16 and Pregnant. So we talked about this episode, and that was roughly aired around June of 2009. Now, why I'm going through all of this is because Teen Mom officially aired in, and this is it, Teen Mom episode 101. This is the very first Teen Mom ever on the planet. So just in case you need to know, it aired in December of 09. So when we talk about behind the scenes, one of the most critical things to bear in mind is while we were filming two months before Sophia was born, Derek Underwood, Farrah Abraham's baby daddy for Sophia, um, passed away in a tragic car accident on December 28th of 2008. So he passed away six months basically before the Teen Mom episode 16 and Pregnant aired. So when we look so when at this episode tonight with our special guest, who you've seen one of these guests in a couple of different Teen Moms uh, episodes. Um, you um, will six... note that we're going to talk about Derek as a past tense because he passed away, for those of you who didn't know that. So that kind of adds to all the complication. And because of the legal issues that were going on behind the scenes and uh, felony charges that were pending, we did not film anything about Derek Underwood. So that's why you don't see it and you don't hear about it. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. So now that I've done all of that to bring you up to speed, I'd like to introduce our two special guests today. And this is all about making sure we get the tea and we understand exactly what was going down because there was some bad stuff in Teen Mom episode 101 that we have just got to get straight. So Travis wearing his blue Versace gorgeous jacket is with us and yes, <laughs> spectacular. And <laughs> Next to him is Waylon, his partner. And we today are going to talk a little bit about, now, Travis, we first saw you pop on the screen in 16 and Pregnant when you went to see Farah and Sophia in the hospital. So yeah. tell us a little bit about, because I saw some of those girls that had been wagging their tongue and talking up a storm and you know <laughs> hey and and let's be clear here I don't think there was a human being in Council Bluffs Iowa that didn't know that Farah was pregnant because there was so much tongue wagging would you agree with that yeah I think even the little old ladies in the nursing home knew about it <laughs> 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 and in the episode and why why i invited you to like talk about this is because i think it's really telling that you went to al farah was at tj and you knew all about this stuff and you were also related to tyler cooksey is all of that correct Yes. So tell me, how many schools do you think the chatter was live and well about Ferris' pregnancy? I I mean, I think it was all of the schools, but it was the entire town. I mean, everybody everybody knew, you know, what kind of what was going on. But um, yeah, in a small town, which I'm sure you know a lot of people are aware of maybe not people from you know new york la whatever but um word spreads fast and when there is a camera crew following someone everywhere i mean everybody everyone knew what was going on 
Yeah. And everyone wanted a piece of the action. I guess that's the way I would put it. <laughs> Absolutely. So what did you feel when you were sitting in the hospital room there and you saw some of these girls coming and going and knowing what you knew about how their true feelings were? Um, I was annoyed and pissed and just couldn't believe that people could go to that extent to try to be on a television show. Mm -hmm. And knowing what some of these girls had said about not only Farah but myself and other friends that I had at the time behind their backs, I'm like, these backstabbing... L little girls uh, like yeah. why are you even here yeah to begin with and yeah it was very uh, annoying but laughable at the same time I think the funniest part was to see Farah's face when she kind of looked up and saw some of the girls and you know she can't really hide <laughs> her true feelings most oh, of really? the time oh really she doesn't yeah. she <laughs> it down <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was funny that she sent some of the girls who she didn't like to get her Italian ices. So she kind of, you know, <laughs> gave them a, a task and a job to to get them out of there and to kind of show, you know, I know you're here not for the right reason, yeah. but to yeah, but yeah. to get your face plastered on TV. Mm -hmm. And so. Just so that everybody understands, so Derek died basically two months before Sophia was born. So he died yeah. in December, into December. Sophia was born <laughs> into February. And I just want to make clear that, you know, Derek Underwood was well known all over town and he was the quarterback on the football team. He was well liked and he was popular. Vera was a cheerleader, as we all know. But because of all of the, you know, gossip and backbiting and just horrible stuff that was going on. I literally had to take Farah out of TJ because she wasn't comfortable. We were worried about her yeah. safety. And so um, I took her over to Metro Tech where she finished high school and graduated. And I'm very proud of her because she worked really hard. So when you graduate, and she graduated yeah. early as well. She did. She graduated mm -hmm. early. And not only that, she was taking college courses when Sophia was born. And then she did go ahead and graduate from Metro Tech in culinary school. So, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. And especially when the baby daddy had just died in a tragic accident. So, what I'd like you to do is just kind of bring us up to speed because you knew Derek and yeah. Derek was not the only one who passed away. Zach, his friend also passed away in that car accident. Yeah. And I used to wrestle Zach Mendoza when I was younger, we were both um, wrestlers. So I knew um, Zach very well. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about the atmosphere when that tragedy happened. Um, it was, I remember when the day it happened, I actually saw the police and everything because I had a paper out from nine until I was, um, 16. And then my younger brother took it over. And so I was helping him and, um, it was on Madison Avenue, right by Timbercrest. And I saw the whole accident that morning because we, I had to take Dalton out to, to deliver newspapers. And so then to find out that it was someone that I knew and someone that it was a friend of mine, it was her, her boyfriend who she loved. And it was also, he, you know, was going to be a, a father and everything. It was really tragic, tragic and just yeah. terrible. But um, I remember trying to call Farah that day and she had shut her phone off because I'm sure 
everyone was trying to get a hold of her and and tell her which i mean to obviously sherry knew but um yeah it was ter it was horrific and um not only i mean for Farah, but his sisters we knew i knew both of his sisters as well mm -hmm. and um it really sent a shockwave through all of Council Bluffs because, you know, kids in a small town like that where they don't have the beach or the mountains or, you know, a lot of really fun things to go do. I mean, kids drink and they drive and it was just terrible that it, that that was the outcome. It was. it was it was tragic and i don't know if you went down to um what they used to call jb auto wrecking yard but mm -hmm. all of the accidents that took place back then the police would have a tow truck come and they put them in this compound and so we went down to the compound and i actually took photos of the car and they had to have the jaws of life to free both Derek and Zach because the car was so smashed up from running into a power pole at high rate. Yeah. And it was yeah. it was really horrible. But the third the third um passenger actually because he was laying on the back seat and I think he was sort of passed out or something. He yeah, was he was ejected from the car. Mm -hmm. And he was dating a girl that lived up in Timbercrest at the time and ran up there and hid in her house. I remember that. Yeah. Well, he, so. he sent Farah a text. So how I know this is because I get premonitions. And so the night before... I looked at Farah and I said, I feel like something's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but I don't have a good feeling. So I said, why don't we just sleep together tonight, watch a movie, you know, just chill out. And so she goes, oh, okay, mom. So in the middle of the night, when all of this was happening, her phone was going off. Now, bear in mind, she's seven months pregnant. She was really tired and she needed her rest because she was going to school full time and trying to, you know, get all of these courses done. So anyway, um, I tried to make sure her phone was at least under the pillow enough. So I tried not to wake her up. I remember getting up at eight o'clock that morning and I was upstairs just starting to make breakfast and Farah came up and she says mom Derek is dead and I said oh that can't be somebody's just doing a horrible prank because you know she had been through all of this gossip and backstabbing and all of these things right mm -hmm. and I, just, I, I guess I was just my mind was blown and she said no she had gotten a text message you know from the kid that was thrown out of the car mm -hmm. and I just stood there who's still I, alive and well today thank god mm -hmm. right but that that's a thing that I'm sure it'll stick with him the rest of his life you know absolutely it was horrifying mm -hmm. So just give us a little bit about, I don't know, did you get to talk to him after the accident to kind of share your feelings or how did that go? No, but I did know his girlfriend and I knew some of her friends. And so I kind of talked to them, but um, no, I was dating someone at the time and my dad had just had a massive stroke. And so he was in the hospital and I had, I was dealing with my own stuff going on. Yeah. And, um, it was really weird. And I, I, I told Waylon about this, but, um, the night after Derek passed away, the person I was, the guy I was dating at the time, um, stayed the night with me because my whole family was over at the hospital and, you know, you can't have more than however many people, you know, we had exceeded the limit. And so I was like, I'll just go home. And 
he started saying some things about Derek and not some not so nice things. And the TV in our kitchen at my parents' house turned on and was blaring. And then the radio in the entryway turned on and was blaring. It was terrifying. It was insane. But um, yeah, I will never forget that. And I was like, <laughs> because it happened close to, I mean, our houses. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Well, here's, here's what's really odd. He died in the very yard that my relatives used to own and wow. where where my baby shower, my mom had the baby shower when she was pregnant with me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so to go by that house and see the shrine that everybody had built for Derek and mm -hmm. Zach, right? And that whole thing was, I mean, still to this day, basically almost 15 years later, there's still a shrine there. People. There's a, there's a cross and yeah they decorate it every you know December and mm -hmm. put out flowers yeah. all kinds of things yeah so it was a big touching moment but imagine trying to film this TV show with all of this stuff going on in the background and then Michael was uh, had pending felony charges against him for pulling a knife on Derek and also for <laughs> you know, punching and trying to beat him up when he caught him in the house after hours after curfew. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there was I remember that I remember things going that. on in the background. Yeah. And uh so it was kind of a wild time. And so when when we were filming, you know, naturally everybody wanted to know, well Farah, are you gonna start dating? Are you gonna go out? Well, you know, it was kind of a very sensitive subject, not only because she had a newborn with Sophia there, but my God, I mean, the grief and the grieving process. And then I was going through a divorce and going through this big transition in my life, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I love part of the episode in 16 and Pregnant where you're up with Brad in um, Farrah's bedroom. And you're trying to give her a little bit of a coaching <laughs> on how it would be good to maybe go out and date a little bit, but you know, have have some friends and, and a good time or a little bit of fun. And I thought that was really a very nice thing to do. But then I guess the next thing I saw was teen mom episode 101 right and yeah. I think I think that Farah was so young and so naive and very trustworthy she trust very she loved people and she trusted people she didn't question people so, at that time, yes, very much. At that mm -hmm. time, she was an innocent. I'm going to put it that way. I, I would define her as an innocent. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the the contrast that I thought was really interesting here, you're over here in this episode and you're trying to give her some coaching. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe she was delirious. Good luck. From <laughs> postpartum and everything, right? But then... <laughs> I flip over to Teen Mom, first episode 101, and she had been dating this guy, Cole. Yes. And, you know, the guy sort of, at first glance, you know, he looked sort of okay, but then I started getting- Well, he was very attractive. That was he pretty was. much the only thing he had going for him. <laughs> but I think, I think in my mind, he was just too attractive or too good to be true, or I don't know how to put that, but that's how it sort of felt to me, a little sketchy. So mm -hmm. I loved- It turned out you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I love the <laughs> I love the episode where you and Farah, Brad, and Cole are sitting at a table, and I think you're trying to have ice cream, and then all of a sudden, 
I think you say something to the effect, well, I'm going to go now. <laughs> and then you bolt up and leave. And then Brad goes behind you. I'm coming too. So tell us why that all happened and why you felt that you had to have the escape route. Well, so we recently watched the episode. I haven't seen that. I mean, I haven't watched that since for over a decade, you know. Right. And we, I remembered, because Waylon and I were talking about it, and it was, we we did drive all the way up to Grand Island. I thought we just drove to Lincoln, but we drove through Lincoln. Okay. And I remember going there and walking in, and a lot of the clientele at this bar, you know, restaurant, whatever you want to call it, they were booing us and they were talking over us and they were just being real dumb. Why? And I remember what, being, what the heck was that about? Oh God, because they had to get clearance to go in to, to film this. Oh. And so the people knew what was going on because 16 and Pregnant had aired. Right. And it's a small town. It's also when... Uh, Farah gets heated she gets very heated and I knew she didn't need my help whatsoever <laughs> to let this idiot know that yeah you know I caught you cheating after you just met my parents for the first time mm -hmm. and you basically lied mm -hmm. and in the episode we were laughing we were laughing because um he said um uh, I said oh so you met the or Brad said you met um uh, Deborah and he said yeah I did and I said uh, what I said how'd that go or I said um <laughs> uh good luck to you or something because <laughs> I knew that she Farrah was not really in a place to be in a serious relationship right. with anyone right. to go out on a few dates and stuff like that you know wasn't that big of a deal but she had a newborn baby at home and she's filming a show and she's in school and she's modeling and you know I, she has always been so busy 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 right. all the time right and so <clears throat> I think I got up because I, <laughs> I felt bad for for the guy honestly because I knew that she was gonna break his heart in front of all these people and on national television but don't you think he deserved it for lying yeah. and cheating but here's what I loved I loved the way Farah kind of entrapped him oh she absolutely did she and did. you know the line of questioning I have to say I was so proud of her because she was like an attorney right it was like so cool. So you dated this other girl? You know this other girl? Oh yeah, we dated. Yeah, but that uh, that that was a long time ago, he said. And so mm -hmm. she Well, when was the last time you saw her? And he goes, "Oh, 3 weeks ago." And so she said, "Oh, so what happened last Friday night?" And did you see how he was like, oh, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> and they put the camera and they put it right up on his face. And he was terrified. And he just like, it was deer in the headlights. It was like, oh my God, you know, then she just put it out there. Oh, so you didn't stay with her. You didn't stay overnight with her at her house on Friday night. Yeah. When that shit when the really shit. hit the fan, right? Well, and then he, he was like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. And she, Farrah being Farrah said, oh, well, why don't we give her a call? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she had already, here's what I And think. then he died again. Oh, yeah, and I thought it was so wonderful that, and here's the thing, we got to set the stage a minute because Council Bluffs, Iowa is a long way from Grand Island. Yeah, like three hours. Yeah. And so a three hour drive. And then when you got there, it took him, it took MTV, the production company, about another hour to get permission to get set up. Get clearance, all that stuff. Yeah. All this time, Farah is weaving her plot to mm -hmm. get him to come clean 
and to tell the truth, right? Oh, we did. We talked about it the whole way there. And then a little, uh, you know, a little bit while we were in Grand Island. But we it's were a also- small, it's a very small community. It's mainly ranching and farming. I didn't think it was a good idea to, knowing for a fact that this guy had lied and cheated and it upset the other girl so much. And I was so proud of her for calling Farah and downloading the whole situation. Right. Yeah. I loved it. She and, could be a friend, you know, she could have, she could be a good friend. Exactly. Well, yeah. I felt like these two women Pink. took the pimple who was Cole and just popped him, you know, <laughs> oh, they did. They really did. They <laughs> and so they popped them. Tell tell me a little bit, just so that everybody knows. How did how did Farah meet Cole? Just so that everybody knows. Um, Farah was modeling, and Cole was modeling, and um, Brad was modeling at the time. I was not. And so we were going to all these fashion shows. We were doing all this stuff. And Brad knew Cole. I think obviously Brad thought Cole was very attractive. And then he found out that Cole was not gay. Mm-hmm. So uh, I he, he tried to put two and two together and, you know, be a matchmaker with Farah, which I think she can find her own match. Oh, definitely. I mean, she <laughs> lit the match. She literally lit. <laughs> she set the. She set the. She ignited the fire and put the launch on. <laughs> she absolutely did, and then walked away. Yeah, and, and so, rightly so rightly so. Yeah, they met through modeling, and and he seemed like a nice guy. He was a small town guy. I think the thing that is so funny about it is he's probably he was probably the hottest thing that Grand Island had to offer. Okay. Oh yeah. So he was used to to probably girls throwing themselves at him and all that stuff. And we all know Farah is not like that. Right. And I'm sure he is probably scarred to this day from that <laughs> interaction with her. The thing I hoped is that he learned his lesson and he would never be nasty like that to anybody else. You know, he probably he probably did for a while, but um you can't change certain people, but yeah. I hope the next girl, you know, got him as good as Farrah did, but I doubt it because <laughs> that was, <laughs> and to do it on national television. Oh my God, <laughs> I know. But then all the way back in the car, how did that go? What did you guys oh, We laughed the entire time, annoyed because it was pitch black out and we had three hours to drive all the way oh. back home. And none of us were 21 at the time. None of us, I mean, obviously, could have stayed and hung out, and maybe checked out the, right, you know, local scene, like there was one. But <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was there was something, but it may not have been interesting, you know. Not whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you didn't know anybody yes. out there, so it was pretty hard to get like, you know, visit friends or anything. So. Mm -hmm. but we I remember we laughed the whole way home and then oh we we also talked about um there was this guy that wanted to take a bunch of photos of us Mm -hmm. and he said he was going to do it for free and we had done the photo shoot I remember this and then he sent us the pictures but you know they had all that little writing at the bottom like the senior picture thing the watermark yeah yeah the watermark we called him and he was like oh it's going to be like a thousand dollars each what <laughs> yeah and i just i remember farah just went off and was like you scam artist you this you that we don't need your <laughs> photos your photos sucked anyway like <laughs> <laughs> i do remember that on the way home yeah that's <laughs> oh my god and what i'm like we're saying? you know 18 at the time who has a thousand dollars to cough up for Pictures. some photos of us standing right. in the alleyway in the old market? I mean, we could have done that with our iPhones, you know. Exactly. Well, not Ridiculous. only that, she was a single teenage mom, right? Yeah. 
and she's working two or three different jobs, trying to go to school, pay for a car. I mean, it's crazy, right? But he saw us. He must have thought we were suckers, but yeah. Well, yeah. Turns you know, out. Anybody, here's the other thing I found is that if people see you on TV, they think you're Kardashian rich, right? And you got money coming from every which way, just flying in. All you have to do is open the window and it smacks you in the face, right? Well, that's not true. And no, that's, I wish it was. I know. <laughs> that first season, we worked without getting paid. Wayne was asking that last night. He was like, I wonder how much, you know. <clears throat> And I thought it must not have been much. Amber was sleeping on a mattress on the floor the entire time. So, I mean, obviously they weren't getting a million dollars. But it wasn't until the ratings came in and they saw the ratings going up exponentially before we started getting any kind of money. Which is wild because you are putting your whole life out there. I always said his big line from... Uh... 16 and pregnant was um he was at the baby shower and he said uh they cut like the camera to him for a second he goes mm, those cupcakes look good and, <laughs> and i was like you should have worked with like a you know a cupcake company or something or made a t-shirt with that on it i, I mean i doubt that yeah. line was really ground <laughs> it was groundbreaking but for the me. cupcakes were delicious and you know that was the first time i had ever seen a cupcake cake before it was beautiful and who doesn't love a cupcake you know well i i went back and forth and back and forth and i said look i can't be standing here cutting cake having crumbs everywhere you know because it's messy and we had a lot of people there and, yeah, well, and some we, of the girls that were there I know have no manners. So I exactly. love the cupcake route. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's why we went with that kind of a setup. And we also, as you have pointed out, you were there. It was co-ed. So we didn't have the traditional. I don't think there was anything traditional that was filmed about us, you know. And then... Just so you know, on my side, I was having people come after me and say, what kind of a mom are you? Why would you put all of your business out there? Why are you letting your daughter go through this? And I said, because I believe women should not be penalized if they got pregnant out of wedlock when the guy just goes off scot-free and, you know, football quarterbacks, all these things that I saw when I went to school, same school, just a different day, right? And those girls had to pay the price. They were talked about, they were ostracized, and they were made to feel less than human. I mean, or they were sent away to have their baby. And then, yeah. you know. And why? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm going to tell you, none of the guys had any repercussions no it was a high five you know good job yeah mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh you're not shooting blanks or whatever you know it was horrible <laughs> it was horrible way I to was, go yeah yeah i was like super super depressed for my two girlfriends so then uh another person came up to me behind the scenes and said you should be ashamed of yourself sharing all your business in public like that and trying to make money off of this. I go, well, first of all, stop right there. And then they said, oh, but you're a Christian. I said, well, you know, funny you should bring that up because I think the Bible back then was their reality TV because there was people getting pregnant out of wedlock. There were people, you know, cheating and doing all kinds of things, right? And that's how they recorded it. Well, we just had a camera and they exactly. wrote it down. So yeah, and where in the record? Bible does it say, you know, you can't, you know, film on MTV after your daughter becomes pregnant? Point right. that out in the Bible. Right. Yeah. To help people. To help people yeah, understand. Right. And it did help people. It did. And then we also went over, and I don't know if you were part of this. I don't remember you being there, but... I also went over to the Open Door Mission and met with Candace Gregory, the CEO, with Farah, 
And we came up with the first Hearts of Hope baby shower. And we raised a whole semi truckload full of diapers, formula, wow. baby clothes for women who had no money, no way to take care of their children. And so that's become an annual event. So we tried, we tried to use the platform and the opportunity to help other people. After you guys got back from Grand Island and all of that stuff with Cole, what what else struck you about the whole how Farah was evolving as a mom, as a new mom, and turning into an adult? Well, at that time, and here's Farah racing, you know, to go to a modeling, to, to go do a photo shoot or to go model or to go to school or racing home to finish stuff for, for school and also having a social life and being a good mom. I always saw Farah take very good care of Sophia. She wouldn't let, I mean, anything happen to her. So, and she was very strict and she was very, she always dressed her so cute and she, yeah was just a good mom and she was really busy and I remember a lot of people were saying well why why are you here why are you not with your baby you know mm -hmm. it's like I'm at a fashion show I'm getting ready to walk down a runway what do you want me to do load her up in a <laughs> stroller and strut down <laughs> with her <laughs> what are you supposed to do you know and Sophia was not even a year old yet I mean and seeing what Farah was doing, hats off to her because she was doing a fabulous job for the resources and for what she had. She always made the best out of it from what I had always seen. And I always, always encouraged her to go out and realize her dreams, right? Mm -hmm. So she was modeling for Barbizon. And Barbizon had found the MTV opportunity. So that all worked out. And I wanted to help her become successful. So I told her, I'll watch Sophia. And Sophia and I loved being together. We had so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I would never trade any of my time with Sophia for anything else in the world because it's better than a bazillion dollars to me because she's my mini me. And I miss absolutely. Her. I miss her terribly. And I hope one day we get to record a song together and do something fun. I wanna I wanna be able to get back together and be able to have a life with her. So that song strong. that Sophia recorded was so cute. Oh, yeah. best friend. Best friend. Yeah. yeah. Bestie, best friend. That's yeah. so cute. Yeah, and you she, were obsessed with it for a while. Yeah, so I was like, this smart, is But don't worry, before it's all over with, my beautiful Sophia is going to do something spectacular. So. Oh, you know she will. It's I wild. Know. She's yeah. already seen the world. She's not even 16 years old yet. I know. <laughs> so. And she's very smart. Mm -hmm. So, Waylon, what, you know, you weren't here for all of this. Well, I didn't even, I'd never seen Teen Mom or 16 and Pregnant until we got together. <laughs> um, in my apartment, we didn't have cable. So I had I'd never seen that. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> yeah. I still ask you questions about it. Yeah, he does. Mm -hmm. He was, he was like, I, I heard, Deborah seems really fun and cool and sweet. And her house is amazing and this and that. And... Yeah. The first thing I think I saw was the, um, your special. Oh. Being Debra. Yeah. We mm -hmm. saw that right after we got together, I think. Yeah, that's kind of when it when it aired. Yeah. Yeah. Because then we watched me and Butch and we laughed our ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna you know what? I almost wore, I almost wore my Butch t shirt. Yeah. And the what other thing the other thing I have in my souvenir pile, just FYI, just in case you want to have a good laugh, is um Gary decided one year he was going to make condoms. So his slogan was, get your Gary on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, Gary was 
sweet, though. He had a kind heart. Oh, I'll oh, never dear. forget it. He walked up to me and he goes, you want a condom? I'm like, well, I don't really have anything to put it on, but okay. <laughs> you know what is so funny? I got this little French bulldog. It's a Louis Vuitton keychain, and I named it Gary because oh. I just thought that's the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, well, Gary, is, Gary. Gary is very sweet. He's very, I think he's a very big hearted person. And yeah, he's a kind, he's a, yeah. a good man. Yeah. He is. He's very kind. And yeah. so and so is his wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Gary ended up meeting this or marrying the sweetest lady. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they're, they're a good match for each other. They are. Mm-hmm. And I think they have a very nice family and they make, I think they make everybody feel at ease and comfortable to be honest and open about their feelings. So, you know, mm-hmm. and to talk through it, not yell yes. through it. Yeah. <clears throat> some of the other questions. Well, I, I don't know some of the stuff like, that. like interesting things. Like one of the people that you, one of the camera people was a camera person on um, the girls next door. Remember one of the girls she filmed Kendra's wedding? That was one of the film crew girls. Oh, well, we had so many different ones. Because, oh my uh, God. <laughs> one was my Flow Blue antique china toilet from Paris. Somebody plugged it up. <laughs> so that caused a plumbing bill of $1,000. That way Farah had the porta potties outside of her house. Well, that that was outside of her house. This happened at my house, but that was mm-hmm. part of the reason. And then, you know, honestly, when you're filming 10, 12 hours a day and it drags on for a week to 10 days at a time, I get mm-hmm. it. You know, you got to have, you're going to have to go to the bathroom. You're going to have to eat. <laughs> the problem <laughs> is, all the toilet paper disappears in the house because you've got at least six new people, right? Plus your own people in the house. So Mm -hmm. the toilet paper goes and the old plumbing in an 1878 house doesn't adequately handle anything past urine. You know, yeah. So that's why she got the porta potties. Never, they never said that about the porta potties outside of Pharaoh's house. They made it sound like Pharaoh was just being evil and like you can't be in my <laughs> house. You know what I mean? Well, they never said that they clogged up, you know, a toilet that's, you know, from <laughs> Queen Elizabeth or, you know, whatever. Like, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, the people who edit the film and put that stuff together, I have never, even working in the Bell Laboratories with all these inventions, you know, the internet, the DHCP, all of these things, right, that I've been part of. The thing that most fascinates me, it was the big deal of my life, was the day that I got to meet the people who cut and edit these, you know, post-production, all right? Mm-hmm. And I looked at these guys and we got to eat with them one night. And I'm like, how do you make me say things I never said? You know, how how does that work? And how did you do this? And how did you do that? I was fascinated by it. And they were such nice people and such professional people. I just sat there in awe. I was just like, wow. I loved it though. I love it. Yeah, they're like kind of twisted, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they, they are. must have a sense of humor, at least. I like. Oh, they do. They they were very mm-hmm. professional. They were very kind to us, and you know, at the end of the day, it was their job. So it's right. it's all good, you know. There was no problem. Yeah. You know, when you film sixteen and pregnant, mm-hmm. um, what happened then? Like so. After it's shown on TV, like, did you guys all get together and watch it together? I will never forget it. So after it was filmed and it was going to air, we, every time there was an episode, we got in front of the TV, the phones went off, nobody bothered us, right? We were all crammed in front of the TV and we were watching it. And then we would sit there and we would say, oh my God, look at this, look at that. Well, that person's an ass. Well, that was really nice. Whatever, right? I mean, it was like start, 
It's like reliving your life over and over and, and over. over again, but from like eight months ago. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here's here's the tipping point. So we still went about life like normal people. And then we got called to New York. And we went inside this huge skyscraper, down some freight elevator, down some real long hallway. I didn't know where the heck I was at. <laughs> Bear and I are going, Jesus, how are we going to get out of this place? I mean, it was <laughs> huge, right? Yeah. And so we're in there filming and filming. And I think we filmed for three days, if I remember correctly. And this was the first time with Dr. Drew. And so each girl would go up on stage and, you know, do the whole thing. The first night we got done, it was after 12 hours. It's pitch black outside. We're all hungry. And that's when our life changed. The door opened up on the elevator and they said, ladies and gentlemen, when you walk outside, there's a limo for each one of you. And we're like, wow, a limo. And your <laughs> limo has your name on it with your driver. And the paparazzi is out there. And I'm like, for who? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, for you guys. And I'm You're like, famous. oh my God. And I just, you know, the thought had never crossed my mind. So we got outside and we were holding, I think I was holding Sophia at that point. And Farrah was kind of like going in front of us, like trying to like block and tackle. She was my Tom Brady. <laughs> 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 oh my God. And there was just people everywhere. And it was like late at night. It was like 10 o'clock or something. And that's when we knew our life would never be the same. Isn't that something? Yeah, yeah that's incredible. That is something. But the worst thing was going to the grocery store the next week after we got home. We were on life. What was it? Life in style. Good housekeeping. I mean, you name it. We were on a cover. The Even Inquirer. The oh, yeah. You don't want to be on that I know one. You're on that. <laughs> yeah, did you yeah. have those moments of being like in the uh, checkout and having somebody, you know, oh, yeah. see your, your, you and then your picture on yeah. the Inquirer they were, you know, standing yeah. next to you? Yeah. And then, yeah. then people just starting to randomly come up to me in the grocery store or in the bathroom or just wherever they could block that into That is so Australia. weird. And yeah. just start downloading on you, you know. And I'm like, wow. Some people, I must say, I love talking to because they were so polite and respectful and genuine. But then, you know, then there's the angry people that come up to you and they don't even know you. And they're, I judging, have that, yeah. they're judging things. And you're like, well, that's not the way it really is. You know, you know, being on TV is a blessing in many, many ways. And I love meeting people and I love talking to people is very inspiring and I love that whole aspect. And the energy is fun. It's fun energy it can be. It is. And you know, I don't know how many times we've talked about therapy, mental illness. We've talked about all kinds of different things on the show, right? Using birth control, safe sex, all kinds of things. And that was part of the show was to help people who, who didn't understand where to go to get help, right? And, mm -hmm. and go get therapy and it's okay to have a problem, but just go address it. So that's the whole thing behind the show is to try to encourage people not to do things <laughs> that were going to be painful for them. Yeah. Yeah. And it did help people. But it's funny you to say that we were watching that episode, um, Farah was hiding her Nuva ring in your freezer. <laughs> oh my God, that really put me over the edge. And we were having, I think we were having a dinner party. I think yeah, that we were was, getting yeah. ready for a dinner party. There was a personal chef there. Yeah. Yeah. And Farah's like trying to figure out how she's going to get her, her birth control out of the freezer. Oh my God. 
I was just oh like, my God. but you know what? At least she was, you know, not make trying to make the right decision and do the right thing. And yeah. But you know, you know me, I'm always so busy. I'm always working, you know. I never have a down moment. I'm always. Oh, she gets it from you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm the last to notice that there's a Nuva ring in the freezer, right? <laughs> Let alone, it always happens in front of an audience, right? There's all these people in the house. There's a chef in the house. You know, we're doing a fundraiser. And what the heck, right? <laughs> Well, that's that's television. That's hilarious. I know. I know. Comedy. Oh my god! My whole life is like that. It's always like that because I always. don't have time to like stop and really analyze everything. Well, I just want to tell you guys, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Is there any last thing that you think our viewers and listeners might find interesting that you would like to share? <laughs> people are painted as characters in reality TV shows because yeah. during the day you can have, you know, a range of moods and emotions. And if you just pick out the, the negative ones, then that's how that person is portrayed, is portrayed yeah. of faults. And, you know, obviously I've never met Farrah, except, but, you. except for me, of course. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> I've never met Farrah, but she's a teenage <laughs> girl. She's, one of the prettier girls in town and she has a lot to say yeah. and i just feel like they portrayed her or they only picked her her bad moments they didn't really get all the good and i think some of it was very exaggerated but i also think what waylon said was really true you've got to remember that they take you at a snapshot moment and it could be one of the worst moments of your life, right? But unfortunately, they're not going to put 24 hours of film out there. They're going to put that 45 minutes of film out there when mm -hmm. you're having your meltdown is hard. I would not want to be the film editors. And, you know, they that's a whole profession. It's a whole discipline. And I will say this. I, to this day, really respect, admire and love most of those people that were on the crew that are executives at MTV because I think they've done a fabulous job in many, many ways. And how do you capture it in a way that helps people to make better decisions in life, right? True. And not, <clears throat> not everybody's going to capture it the right way. Not everybody's going to get it right. But I can honestly tell you, because you've said it, I do love my daughter very much. And I love Sophia very much. And, you know, I was with her morning, noon, and night to try to make her successful and happy and make her feel that she was worthy. And I think a lot of what happened behind the scenes with... um people clawing and scraping and trying to pull things out of you and take from you all the time. I think that had a profound effect on her in a negative way too. I think, I think you're right. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can understand that pressure because not everybody ever experiences that kind of pressure. You know, I guess it's always like this song. I like, um, be careful what you get, what you wish for. Cause you just might get it all. And then some, you don't want. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite lyrics in his song, because honestly, and then he had one of his children commit suicide and it was just heartbreaking, you know, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, don't realize how mature you need to be to be able to withstand pressure and peer pressure and all kinds of scrutiny that goes on in this world, I guess. Well, yeah, you and know. imagine being dealt with, dealing with that when you're 16 or 17. Yeah. You know, and, and then also like postpartum emotions and- And Derek, um, Derek being killed, right? 
Yeah. And then I'm going through a divorce. I had just retired as a global telecom executive. And I mean, it was just one thing after the other going on. And I would tell and you- you're renovating multiple homes at this time. <laughs> I mean, like you name it, you had it going on. Yeah, we had houses all- You're tearing down apart. houses in the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I'll never forget it. The street was blocked off one day and this woman jumps out of her car and she looks like she was like late for something and just having a crisis. She jumps out of her car in front of my house. She looks at me and says, why have you got the street blocked off? I go, well, ma'am, I don't own the street and I didn't block it off. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah, I was always having a backhoe, tearing out a house, you know, making space, making room. <laughs> yeah, we, have a, we had a lot going on. And one other thing I want to make clear, Farrah did grow up in an affluent situation she no, did absolutely not, she did not grow up in a poor you know beaten down situation and so well, i mean she had what tiffany lamps um at yeah. the end of her banister yeah. <laughs> i mean not even that that is the thing but i mean you send her to you know, Barb is on where she was taught manners and to speak eloquently and to use utensils the proper way. And just, I mean, she was given a lot more than a lot of people in our town could have even imagined. Well, and I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, something that... And she grew up with a lot of love. I mean, we know how yeah. loving you you are, so... Something you know, you've always said is, you know, in that town, um, you know, money is like an important thing. And um, when a lot of people in the same community don't have a lot of right. money, right. you end up, if you, you know, if you are one of the um, more affluent people in town, you end up being kind of a target for their yeah. frustrations or their resentments or their criticism. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she kind of dealt with that. Um, as well a lot yeah. I've been in situations where I had to travel a lot to many countries one country I was taken hostage in and you know hey I know. I know. you cannot be a wallflower and survive this kind of stuff and so yeah maybe I sounded like a drill sergeant at times or like a boot camp <laughs> Yeah, but you also talked to gunmen off of a I'm... tour bus. Yeah, you, you have to tell that story somehow. You, you have to. Very proud of Farrah because she does have the leadership capabilities that I have. And I'm very proud of her because she works really hard and she puts her whole heart and soul into it. And I think that's all good for Sophia, you know, because Sophia is extremely bright. Mm -hmm. But I also know that it's very hard for her to stand up alone because there's been a lot of pressure in this world and it takes its toll mm -hmm. on so, so I just would ask everybody to be kind to each other and realize that when you have somebody in your life and you love them or you care about them, or even if you have somebody that's annoying, just remember they're a human being like you are and you should just be nice. And at the end of the day, then you can go to bed and go to sleep and know that you were nice to somebody, so, right? <laughs> For everybody's yeah. sake, we all just need to throttle down a little, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Very thank good. you so much for being on the show. It's so good to see you guys. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and your feelings because you were there and you know, and you've watched and you've listened and you're part of the family. So thank you very much. Thank you. We adore you. Thank you.